You're listening to the Study Legal English podcast, the world's first legal English podcast, helping lawyers and law students become fluent in legal English. Hello and welcome to the Study Legal English podcast. I am your host Louise and in the past few episodes we've been looking at criminal procedure. In the last podcast episode, we heard about what happens after the commission of a criminal offence, including the investigation of a crime and the charging of a suspect. Today, we are going to look at what happens after a criminal prosecution is commenced. We will look specifically at what happens during the pre-trial hearing for different types of offences. So, let's get started. After a defendant is charged, the defendant must appear on a specific date in the magistrate's court at what is known as the first court appearance. This is held in open court, meaning that the public can watch. If any problems arise, such as the defendant becomes ill and won't be able to attend the hearing, then the court may agree to adjourn the hearing on for example, medical grounds. This means that the hearing will be suspended or delayed due to the defendant being ill. And what happens at this first appearance? Well, this really depends on the type of offence the suspect is charged with. Let's start with the summary-only offences. Remember that these are the least serious offences, such as motoring offences, minor assault and disorderly behaviour. They can only be dealt with in the magistrate's courts, which are inferior criminal courts of first instance. They are called summary-only offences because the most common way of starting proceedings is that the accused is summoned to appear in court, meaning that they are sent a written court order. If the charge is for a summary-only offence, then the defendant has the option to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty at this initial appearance. If the defendant pleads guilty, there is no need for a criminal trial and the magistrate's court will proceed to sentencing, which normally happens on the same day. With some summary-only offences, the accused has the option to plead guilty via post. If this is the case, then he or she will not have to appear in court, and the case will be dealt with by the magistrate's court in his or her absence without the presentation of evidence by the prosecution or defence. If, however, the defendant pleads not guilty, or in fact remains silent, the procedure which follows is quite different. The magistrate will fix a date for the trial proper, and the defendant will have to appear in court again for this. What about the initial appearance with either way offences? Remember that either way offences are offences which can be tried either in the magistrate's court or in the crown court, depending on how serious they are. And these include offences such as theft, burglary and harassment. For either way offences in this initial appearance, there is a plea before venue where the defendant is asked to indicate a plea of guilty or not guilty and an allocation of the case to either the magistrate's court or the crown court. This allocation procedure was previously called the mode of trial proceedings. So, what actually happens here? Well, firstly, a member of the court normally the justice's legal advisor or the district judge, will read the allegation of the offence to the defendant 
and explain very clearly to the defendant what this allegation means, what an either way offence is, and what the consequences of pleading guilty or not guilty are. The court will then ask whether the defendant intends to plead guilty. If the defendant says yes, the court treats this as though the defendant has just pleaded guilty at a trial at the magistrate's court. The defendant is convicted and the court proceeds to sentencing either in the magistrate's court or, alternatively, the case is sent to the Crown Court for sentencing. If the defendant indicates an intention to plead not guilty or remains silent, which is equivalent to indicating a not guilty plea, then the following procedure is quite different. The court must explain very clearly to the defendant a number of matters related to the next procedure, related to where the case will be allocated. Then the court will invite the prosecutor and the defendant to make representations related to the case, including how the court should allocate the case and any previous convictions of the defendant. Following this, the court will exercise its power to allocate the case for trial. And I'll tell you all about this procedure after this very short break. I'm interrupting the Study Legal English podcast for an important announcement. Do you want to get ahead in legal English? If you'd like to make faster progress with your legal English, you can sign up as a podcast pro member and get access to transcripts, quizzes and much more. You can track your learning progress and even earn course certificates. Take your legal English to the next level. Visit studylegalenglish.com forward slash podcast dash pro. Great. So, when choosing the venue for trial, the Magistrates' Court will consider the allocation guidelines issued by the Sentencing Council, which advise that cases should be tried summarily in the Magistrates' Court unless they are very complex, serious, or if the defendant were to be found guilty, that the Magistrates' Court's sentencing powers would be insufficient. It's important to note that the maximum penalty the magistrate's court can impose is six months in prison for a single offence, with an aggregate maximum of 12 months in prison for multiple offences. And although in the past the magistrate's court could only impose fines of up to £5,000, this cap has now been removed and they can in fact impose unlimited fines for specific offences. If the court allocates the case to the Crown Court, the case must be sent to the Crown Court. On the other hand, if the court allocates the case to the Magistrates Court, there are two options. Firstly, the defendant can accept the jurisdiction and the case will be heard at the Magistrates' Court, although the prosecutor can apply for the case to be sent for trial at the Crown Court. Or, secondly, the defendant can reject the jurisdiction, in which case the case will be sent to the Crown Court for trial. Before making the decision as to whether to accept or reject the magistrate's court's jurisdiction, the defendant is allowed to ask the court questions related to the type of sentence he could face at the Crown Court. Following this, he will be asked once more whether he pleads guilty. If he does, then the case will proceed as though the trial has taken place, and if not, the case will be sent to the Crown Court. If the case is to be sent to the Crown Court, then the way that this happens 
is that the magistrate's court must send a notice to the Crown Court detailing each offence the defendant is charged with. This is normally done electronically nowadays as the Crown Court has in recent years adopted paperless trials. Parties must also comply with this paperless system and all essential trial documents such as indictments and witness statements must be uploaded onto the digital case system which can then be accessed via various devices such as computers, tablets, smartphones, etc. So, the notice which is sent from the Magistrates' Court to the Crown Court constitutes a draft indictment, which is sometimes called a Bill of Indictment, and this means a written accusation of an indictable offence against a suspect. An indictment is required for all offences tried at the Crown Court. The defendant will also be given a date to appear in the Crown Court for a plea and trial preparation hearing. This is a pre-trial hearing which normally occurs within 28 days of sending. At the plea and trial preparation hearing, the defendant is arraigned. This means that the defendant is identified by name The indictment is read aloud, detailing the charges against him or her, and the defendant is asked to plead guilty or not guilty. Through this process, the bill of indictment becomes the indictment. The official way to say this, which is written in the criminal procedure rules, is to prefer a bill of indictment. To prefer a bill of indictment literally means to bring or lay a charge or indictment before the defendant in the Crown Court. If the defendant pleads guilty, he or she should be sentenced as soon as possible, and normally this is immediately. If, on the other hand, he or she pleads not guilty, a number of things happen. The judge will set a trial date and further information about what is needed for the trial will be discussed, such as witness requirements. The trial judge will set a timetable with dates for deadlines that the parties must comply with for the necessary pre-trial preparation. This timetable normally has four stages – Firstly, the service of prosecution materials. Secondly, the service of the defence response. Thirdly, the prosecution response to the defence materials. And fourthly, for the defence to provide any final materials. In most cases, there is only one plea and trial preparation hearing – But in very complex cases, a further case management hearing will be arranged. Following this, the defendant awaits trial. So what about indictable-only offences? Remember that indictable-only offences are the most serious offences, such as murder and rape. These cases can only be tried in the Crown Court and the defendant must be sent an indictment. However, they start with a very brief initial appearance in the Magistrates' Court. Here, the defendant is simply charged with the indictable offence and the case is sent straight to the Crown Court. The defendant is given a date to appear at the Crown Court for the plea and trial preparation hearing and the same procedure for the plea and trial preparation hearing in the Crown Court for either way offences is followed. Again, then the defendant must await the trial.
Great. So that's the end of today's episode where we've looked at the pre-trial hearing before a criminal trial. In the next episode, we will be looking at the trial itself. A lot of the vocabulary I used in this episode is contained in the Criminal Procedure Rules Glossary, which you can find on the justice.gov.uk website. I will leave the link in the podcast notes, so be sure to check that out if you want to find some definitions to criminal law vocabulary straight from the horse's mouth. That's an English idiom, which means straight from the people who said it, or in this case, straight from the people who make the rules. Of course, Podcast Pro members get access to further learning materials at studylegalenglish.com, so head over there for all your member benefits. If you haven't checked out the Study Legal English YouTube channel yet, be sure to do so as you can find all of the podcast episodes there too. Just head to YouTube and search for Study Legal English. So thank you for listening and see you next time.